Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's session. My name is Kyle Jacques Rose, um, IDF Vice President and Chair of the Working Group on Youth Activities. We're delighted to have you joining us today. And uh, in today's session, we hope to uh, cover a number of topics about the open application for the current WILD cohort, as well as celebrate the 10 years of this program. And I am coming to you from France uh, today, and we're going to have uh, a number of people joining from all over our various regions. This uh, session will also be recorded for those who perhaps uh, weren't able to attend live, uh, who were in a time zone where it wasn't particular friendly to, to that region. So, we expect there to be many viewings after the fact. So I'm delighted to be joined uh, today by uh, IDF uh, President, Professor Andrew Bolton, who I would like to pass the microphone to for a few opening remarks to today's session. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you very much, Kyle. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you might be across the world. It's a great pleasure for me to uh, say a few welcome words to this very important webinar celebrating 10 years of the Young Leaders in Diabetes program, which is really an essential part of IDF's really core business, if you like. Diabetes affects people at all ages, but particularly difficult for young people, including children, and of course it can be a threat to health and prosperity. IDF is really committed to work with youth and I was very happy to meet many of you at the Busan meeting, at the end of the meeting, when I met with many of the young leaders of diabetes, uh, who are clearly a very active group from all of our regions right across the world. And I congratulate Kyle Jacques Rose, who's a very active vice president of IDF, who's done so much for this program. And therefore, we are celebrating 10 years of young leaders in diabetes, over 260 people have participated through this program in the last 10 years. And we're proud of the work that has been done uh, through the IDF with the Young Leaders in Diabetes. And we encourage all our members to collaborate locally and nationally and internationally with young people and to nominate candidates for this program, which is so important, bringing up people uh, living with diabetes to help others and really to spread the word that so much can be doing, done in terms of prevention for those people who have diabetes, preventing the late complications. So much can be done today with many modern therapies. So I wish you a very happy webinar and I'll hand back to Kyle, the chairman. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Andrew. We appreciate uh, you being here with us for today's celebration and today's session where we hope to inform and, and answer a number of questions uh, through uh, both a panel session that we'll, we, we will be carrying out um, as well uh, as a, a session where the IDF office members who are looking after the administrative aspects of the problem, uh, program will walk you through uh, the nomination process. So the, the Young Leaders with Diabetes uh, program uh, is is actually a project that was established um, before the initial program of of the Dubai Congress in 2011. Its origins uh, were in a program uh, called the Youth Ambassadors, uh, and this was a one week training uh, with uh, youth in in Cape Town in 2006. Uh, before I was involved uh, with the organization, but I. Have since, since I've taken over this role, spoken to a number of folks who have participated in it, and I'm delighted to know that there has been a long tradition of, of working with youth in, in the IDF global initiatives. In 2011, we started with a program in Dubai, which you'll hear more from uh, some of our panelists uh, about uh, that had the structure uh, that still exists for the most part today. And uh, I think that it's, uh, it, it's an interesting time for us to be talking about uh, an anniversary. It's a difficult time for many of our regions and countries and member associations. And I would like to 
of course, acknowledge that uh, that during these these difficult times, uh, we're all doing our best to continue and maintain uh, activities that have been so fruitful and, and productive in the past. And we appreciate all of the member associations and YLD and YLD alumni who are, are joining us uh, today. Please, next slide. So part of the objectives of the program will be no surprise to you. Uh, not only do we want to raise awareness of uh, what's going on in, in diabetes, but we also want to provide a training and a platform for advocates to be the future leaders uh, of tomorrow for the work that your member associations and your organizations are already doing in your countries. But hopefully with almost a spider arms approach where we can create more who are helping deliver that message and make a bigger impact. And not only that, we want to help support and strengthen uh, the, the regions and take an approach where we can connect uh, our young people internationally uh, to build a global movement for diabetes and develop projects to address the needs of the people within their local regions and, and national, regional and local levels. So the program uh, scope is a three-year online program, and, and that's a really important statement. And I think that uh, many of the questions we get are around the face-to-face -face education opportunity, which happens at the time of the World Diabetes Congress. Of course, the program continues in between these face-to-face -face, um, learning opportunities and training opportunities. And, and this has uh, been even more the case in the last year and a half where we haven't had those those face-to-face -face opportunities. So in addition to this training summit, which happens live, um, it's important to note that this is just one component of the, the YLD program. And the as you can see in, in the slide, uh, we talk about some of the different uh, types of, of materials and uh, events that we do, either through webinars on, on key topics or information, uh, document dissemination about IDF global advocacy campaigns and, and how to support them. Whereas the Wild Training Summit in person uh, has a, a different feel to it, of course, because you're there together. Uh, but you're covering a lot of, of the same material in a more intense time. And I look forward to the panel session where we can hear from some of our, our members and past members who uh, have experienced this and can speak to you about it firsthand. And just maybe a last comment on the face-to-face. -face. Uh, I've been a very fortunate uh, with my role at, in IDF Europe uh, that I was able to participate in some of these earlier sessions. So both in Dubai uh, and in Melbourne, I spoke uh, and participated in the event in, in various different functions. Uh, and then what was really interesting was we saw that there was just an incredible momentum from past YLD alumni working together over the course of the years, beginning some of their projects independently and working with each other across borders. So that's been wonderful to watch over the course of the last 10 years, even if I've only been in my current position uh, for the last year and a half. Next slide, please. So this shows exactly that. Uh, we have gone from, from Dubai to, to Melbourne, to Vancouver, to Abu Dhabi, and, and then most recently in, in Busan. Um, and here are pictures of those groups. Thank you, next slide, please. Um, one of the things we really like to emphasize when we're speaking to member associations is that we see this as an opportunity for your organization to either engage with someone who is already working with you and provide an opportunity for them, or perhaps engage with a population that uh, you haven't been able to, to engage with before. And engage perhaps doesn't best capture that, but working together and collaborating with young people and expanding the scopes of your organization and audiences of your organizations to include young people is oftentimes something we hear from member associations, which, which can be challenging, particularly when they're looking at a population which covers a, a large range of, of ages, uh, whether it be type one, type two, or other forms of, of diabetes. And we believe that these young leaders can help by being innovative, by understanding the latest, knowing what's going on with youth in their respective countries and regions, and therefore help IDF members grow. 
they could share their knowledge with other young advocates. And again, this notion of collaborating across borders is very true to uh, the federation that we are today, the International Diabetes Federation. And we believe that they are an inspiration to children and to young adults uh, living with diabetes around the world. So um, that, that is a, a short summary of the, the program. And uh, as we go through the uh, session today, we hope to answer any questions about how that nomination process will work. Uh, please note that there is currently an active 26 for the nominations. One of the points that uh, we, we wanted to emphasize is that the YLD projects uh, must use the training uh, provided by IDF to, to work with projects that, that positively impact their communities. Uh, I mean, this is, this is pretty much common sense is why the, the program exists is to help move forward projects um, that not only uh, support the mission of, of the nominating IDF members, uh, but also perhaps take a somewhat different approach and innovative approach as, as was mentioned on the previous slide. The Wildies can start a project from scratch uh, or many times they also engage in existing projects that the IDF member may have going on, whether they're annual campaigns or, or otherwise. This is something that the members work together with the YLD to, to figure out. And then uh, at IDF, we ask for a report that uh, we collect regularly on, on the project just to make sure that progress is going forward, and if not, try to figure out why and, and how we can help. So that, that was the short summary, and I'm, I'm really delighted to introduce um, some very important people in our next, uh, next panel who have uh, incredible experience. Uh, in fact, they had experience that was quite incredible before they joined uh, the YLD program, and the way that they've been able to uh, use this program to incorporate what they're already doing and expand it and, and reach other people, I think is something that never ceases to impress me. So um, I, will, I will allow them each to perhaps do a brief introduction themselves. And I'm just gonna read their names as I see them on my, on my screen. Uh, so starting with uh, Alex Silverstein from the United Kingdom. Uh, who was a YLD trainee during the 2011 and 2013 period. He also had some other positions, which I'll let him tell you about and share about. Uh, then we have Ms. Jazz Sethi from India, who was a YLD trainee uh, 2019 to 2022, so that's current. Uh, and then Ms. Johanna Ko from the Philippines, a YLD alumni uh, a trainee from the 2017 to 2019 time period. So with that, um, I, my first question uh, I would like to ask is actually more just of a brief introduction, if you wouldn't mind, uh, so that I can do you justice in all the various things that, that you're doing. Alex, would you like to kick us off, please? Sure. Thank you so much, Carl. Can you hear me? Brilliant. Um, so my name is Alex Silverstein. I work um, now for the National Health Service in the UK. That's where I'm from. Uh, and I was the first ever president of the YLD program. Um, and I went to the conference in Dubai and also in Melbourne. Thank you, Alex. Jazz, would you like to go next, please? Namaste, everyone. Thank you so much, Kyle. Um, my name is Jazz Dehti. I am from India. I'm part of the current YLD training program. Um, I run a foundation called the Diabetes Foundation in India, which is a mission to make those with type 1 diabetes feel heard, understood, supported, and celebrated with many different projects that we're trying to reach the unreached. And um, I'm very excited to be a part of this panel and, of course, of YLD. Thank you. Go ahead, John. Hi, uh yeah, <laughs> sorry, I'm Johanna. So I joined YLD for 2017 and I'm currently helping out in ways I can through writing and also in sharing my time through speaking engagements, uh, YLD or IDF or other uh, companies, pharma companies. Thank you. Thank you for that. And I'm also being reminded by my colleagues that I, I did a 
fail to introduce myself, uh, so I'll do uh, I'll I'll be the last one in this round, um, and and I'll keep it brief. Uh, my work with the International Diabetes Federation started in the European region, where I was part of the board for several years, and my activities have been primarily in the two geographies where I've lived, in the United States and in France. In France, it's with the Fédération Française des Diabétiques a member association that has been very active for the idea for, for a long time. I'm lo active at the local level in the uh, Rhône-Alpes region, at the foothills of the French Alps. And uh, in with the American Diabetes Association, I'm working primarily in California, which is where I've had some uh, number of, of working years. So my role in the IDF Europe camps was focused on sports and, and activity at first, and uh, I was delighted to grow with my role with, with the organization. I'd like to move right along with um, to hear more about you guys, uh, and and maybe as a as a first question, how has the YLD contributed to your life? It's a big question. Um, Alex, would you like to kick us off again, please? Sure. Thank you, Carl. Um, so I think that the YLD has allowed me to have friends first and foremost around the world that are passionate about improving the lives of people with diabetes. And it's also been incredible to meet the all different uh, organizations and the way they're run and, and be able to support many of them. Um, coming from the UK where we have Diabetes UK, which is, I think charity is a big thing in the UK. So it's been going since 19, I think 37 or something. It's, a, it's an early organization. So being able to share stuff with with people but also learn a lot um i mean for example from the nordic countries that have a fantastic youth movements of their own um from you know places around the world it's, it's been really uh such a great thing for my life and the project management skills that i learned as part of the training i think were invaluable and they really did um set me apart as well as the leadership skills um from many of my organization which allowed me to yeah rise rise quite quickly um and I, I i can't thank the idf enough um for sending me somewhere warm in december as well so that's a once in a lifetime opportunity for someone from the uk so um yeah that that was pretty good too thank you alex who would like to go next I could go. Um, I would say that uh, to be part of YLD is really a privilege. Um, it has opened my eyes tremendously. Um, when I joined the 2017, it has been a surreal experience because it's my first. It was my first time to see the beautiful people from different walks of life, and you can feel that instant connection right away, even without knowing them. It's like they're part of your family. And yeah, um, it, it feels like when you see them, when I see all of you, it's like we're part of each other. Um, so that interconnectedness is really something beautiful because it doesn't, it didn't last just for that one week long, but also lifelong. So up to this day, I would, I am very grateful for the people that I've met that I'm still connected with. And it's such a blessing because we get to see and help one another in ways that we don't know, but you feel connected and belong. Thank you, Johanna. Jazz, please go ahead. Absolutely, I completely align with my colleagues over here. I think we always talk about peer support being so fundamental to those living with diabetes or with type 1 diabetes also. And to be a part of a community which echoes that is very, very special. To learn from them, to be inspired by them, to share your work with them. And I think also with Wildly, um, I think it's not, it's so much more than just people. You, you're getting to, you're getting exposure to some of the best information out there. You're constantly upping your game knowledge-wise as well. So you're growing as a person, you're growing as a person with diabetes, and you're growing with people as well. And I think that's the most beautiful feeling when you live with something so constant is to constantly have people to inspire and support you. So I'm very thankful for that. Thank you for those remarks. You know, I think one of the questions I often get from 
uh, from member associations is that there are a number of youth activities going on in their respective countries already. Now, clearly, we have a lot of member associations today from all around the world, so those are different. But oftentimes, they want to know what what's different about this, and perhaps a good way to answer that is what what was the main takeaway for you? You, you began to touch on it a little bit already, but from YLD, what would you say is the one or two main takeaways? And we'll keep going in uh, in the same order, if that's all right with everyone. Alex, please go ahead. It's easier on my screen. I'm going in this order. Sure. So, <laughs> um, so for me, one of the the main takeaways, as I said, is and and Joanna touched on that that family, that lasting relationship that is not beneficial just for the individual, but is beneficial for the IDF organization that are sending these young leaders. Um, that that last a lifetime um and we you know it, it's creating that early I, I talk about when i talk about the yld um i like football so I, I talk about barcelona which you know through 2000 to 2020 was probably the best team in the world and the reason many people don't know is because in 1970 so 30 years earlier they built a youth academy and they brought the best people to that youth academy and they invested in their youth. And in the same way, YLD, I can see, you know, already there's fruit coming from the relationships that the people in Dubai had, um, if not for, for later programs. Um, and you can see organizations that have been built in Pakistan that are supporting people with access to insulin um, and I've actually linked them up with people in the UK that I work with uh, to produce uh, books and um, information about Pakistan food. So there, there's these kind of um, kind of synergies and supports that that will last for many many years into the future. So it it really is an investment, I think, for for organisations, and they may not uh, feel like they're they're getting it straight away, but trust me, it does come and it. I think for the majority of the people that were there in Dubai, all of them delivered successfully those projects and benefited their member associations. Uh, so for me, those long lasting relationships that benefit uh, everyone is the main takeaway. Thank you, Alex. Go ahead, Jana. Uh, my main takeaway is it's all right to really speak out and be empowered. Um, it's also good to be honest and be vulnerable. Um, I would say everyone experiences stigma everywhere. It's it's an absolute, um, and uncertainty is also an absolute. Uh, but so it's easy to uh, hide, to be silent, to avoid judgment. But through that YLD, I learned that. Your voice, um, speaking out, being an advocate, may lessen that stigma. The strength of our voice is immeasurable, and anyone can be an advocate. Whether you have a small project, big project, it doesn't matter, because your heart is there, and you make a difference. That tiny difference is still something. And I would like all of you to focus more on how your voice can be a blessing to many. Here, here, I'll take that challenge. Thank you, Johanna. Jazz, your turn. I think the biggest takeaway for me, it's always been about impact. And what I feel is with the YLD project, I think the, the, the key emphasis on the word leader, to become a leader living with diabetes. And then I truly believe in this ripple effect idea, the circle of influence with your project, whoever you're impacting whether it's one person, whether it's 20 people, whether it's 20,000 people, you are subconsciously and uh, indirectly creating so many more leaders. So I think the YLD is not just measured by the few of us who are a part of this project. It's actually the leaders that you're creating who are not even part of this project, but have been empowered by this agency. So I think the biggest takeaway for me has been that the YLD project platform, the accountability uh, towards the YLE program and sort of executing your project and creating that circle of influence and impacting lives um, far more than you would have thought possible. And that's something that I've truly taken away from this. So let's focus on that. Thank you for bringing that up, Jez. How, uh, I think a lot of the member associations would like to know how that process went 
and, and maybe maybe from this point on we can just kind of go around to who has a good example uh, in terms of answering my question if that's all right to, to use our time most efficiently but uh, talk to me maybe one of you about how how it worked working with your member association were you already working with them beforehand uh, and how did you go about discussing the project with them I can take that maybe to begin with uh, so yes, I was working not so directly with my member organization, but I was working closely with them on a few other projects. Um, and then sort of when they nominated me, I began this really close relationship with them for the execution. Um, constant follow-up, constant meetups, ideating, soundboarding with them, uh, constantly staying in touch with the YLD team as well. Um, and the quarterly reports, I think um, it's so important for us to keep track and be accountable for the work we're doing. And oftentimes it was a great way when we were creating, when I was personally creating the quarterly report to sort of reflect back and see what worked, what didn't work. Because often, you know, you're just going with the flow so much you forget to like pause and say what's happening. But with the quarterly reports, with the constant check-ins, you get a chance to reflect, to refine, and then to take forward. And then working with the member organizations became such an organic process. Um, and it became a great way to sort of measure the impact do the change, create the project, and then figure out how you're moving forward as well. Anyone else like to con uh, contribute on that point? So I, I was working for Diabetes UK when I uh, joined in Dubai, and they, they were very supportive. Um, and I, I think there's, again, just going back to the power of the YLD, young people are quite a nice um, investment opportunity and they're they're very good if i speak so myself at fundraising so our fundraising team didn't find it difficult to get some money um to support my project which was to create my own kind of youth leadership program in the uk and um and they they were very supportive and it it's it created a youtube channel for the organization it brought them a lot of interest from uh, younger people who maybe hadn't heard of Diabetes UK before. Um, and that was really lovely. It, it definitely contributed to changing what was already quite a big organization. Um, but I saw something very similar uh, amongst the other young leaders and their, their projects. And one example I'd pick out is um, the Dia Euro, which is me talking about football again, uh, in Ukraine that is now a yearly competition or a bi-yearly competition of people with diabetes playing football around the world that was a partnership between uh, a young leader project and the you know kind of ukraine diabetes association um and i, I think irina who's on the idf board who who's you know from there she was heavily involved and i, I think so when you do support it it can do lasting really impressive uh, impact, like Jazz said, <laughs> um, for for the future. That's a great uh, example, Alex. I'm sure uh, Irina Vlasenko, who's I think listening to today's session, would be happy of a mention of of Dia Euro and all the work she's done to contribute there. Yeah, please go ahead, Johanna. Uh, on my end, unlike Jazz and Alex, um, before joining YLD, I was not really working with my Diabetes Association. I know my association, but I was not really very active, uh, but I'm willing to help out, hence I got nominated. In fact, on my first YLD, it was my first time to hear about projects. I was surprised, <laughs> like, oh, there's advocacy, la la la. I was really stunned. So I had a lot of questions on my, on my during my YLD, um, then I, uh, but after so much learning during that week long, I reached out to my association when I got back. So when I got home, I shared that these are the things that I would like to create support group, education, and awareness. I do understand that there's challenges when it comes to resources. So the good thing is that you are able to find ways that are that are low cost or cost friendly. And in on that end, I because there's limited, um, I just, normally I just uh, shell out on my own. So what I did is to really ask 
for people who might want to support and share their resources. And one of the good things was during that YLD, my, my YLD mates shared their own incident for me to bring home. And that was something that I was so shocked. Like, oh my gosh, really? You're gonna share these incident for me to give back to my to my friends? And that was the start. I was so stunned that I couldn't believe that my fellow who brought a lot of insulin gave me insulin and to be shared. Yes, and that was documented. I, <laughs> you can see in my, um, yeah. So that was a really life-changing moment. So it, we all can help one another. So my MA a very, was very strong with, message. Oh, thank yeah. you. <laughs> yeah, sorry, finish your point, Johanna. Yeah. So on that note, my MA was supportive when I did reach out, but I have to also be responsible in accommodating, in meeting um, their level, their capacity. Uh, so for instance, if I was, my projected uh, project would cost like this, and they said, oh, we could only support this much. Okay, so I will work on that, uh, on what's available. At least there's something rather than nothing. So I'm thankful on that end. Thank you for that. Yeah, you know, as a facilitator of the program, um, one of the points you touched on uh, is something I've certainly experienced while I've been in the room before, where uh, we have, you know, representatives from obviously different countries around the world talking about the access that they have to care supply or medicines and the vast discrepancy in this access, even within a region like Europe, we see this, but even more uh, of a profound discrepancy ac across the world and the learnings. Uh, and there's there's one example that um, I remember from um, a regional interaction that really touched my heart. It was someone from the Scandinavian area who had, hadn't realized um, that they're you know on the on the eastern side of Europe with one of her colleagues in, in this particular um, classroom was struggling to have access to the very supplies that she was complaining about not having enough of a choice. I think it was around insulin pumps or one of these types of technologies. And it was so strong that mark on her that when she came back to her home country, she wrote about it and uh, began trying to uh, create awareness for uh, for for that other country, which I thought was a beautiful, a beautiful example. Uh, I want to open it up to questions because I know we have a number of people watching today, and and I'm not great with this platform, so I'm trying to see if we have uh, questions that have been uh, lined up for me. Let's have a look here on the on the chat. Uh, Okay, uh, this this is a good question. Um, what tips and suggestions do you have uh, to continue supporting and discovering other young people like yourselves? Um, I think you can still consider yourself young. I hope you can, because if you can't, then I'm really in trouble. Uh, other young people like, like yourselves to, who can help associations and help change the reality of diabetes in their respective countries. So I think the question is really about identifying and recruiting uh, fellow fellow young leaders. Would anyone like to take that one? Yeah, I mean, I think I can give a personal example over here. Um, so we were when we when I started the Wiley project, like my team was five people strong, um, and you know those five people were were very interested. They were excited. They were wanting to be a part of this project, and then COVID hit. And when COVID hit, I thought that whatever work has been done, it's all going to go down the drain because what's going to happen? And to my surprise, the absolute opposite happened because we were so bound by the physical nature of the project that we forgot to reach places. You know, we, we didn't realize that reaching place could be this easy as well. So once COVID hit, once the pandemic happened, we sort of explored it and we started reaching out places that we never thought that we could have gone to actually physically. So like small towns in India where I've never even heard of this town, you know, these kind of places started coming in. When the virtual world became a reality, 
slowly people started getting really excited by this concept and people started approaching. And whenever we said anyone, I think the idea is that if there is interest, there is absolute potential. The first thing is that a person needs to be interested. A person needs to want to do something. That drive, you can't teach. You can teach everything else. But if a person inherently has interest, has some amount of passion, has some sort of intention, then everything else can be taught, trained, everything possible. So whenever somebody with the slightest interest message me, I want to be a part, I would just say hop on. Everything else can be figured out. And today we are 30 members strong. The core team of Diabetes has now 30 members from five to 30. And all those 25 people that joined just said one thing, I want to do something. And that is all that is required. If you have intention, action follows. So I think that would be my advice that if anyone has interest, don't worry about the skill, don't worry about their background, nothing. Passion is there, everything else will follow. That would be my advice. For me, Are you I... getting me uh, passionate just listening to you? Yeah, go ahead, Johanna, please. Sorry, I cut you, but uh, for me, um, I it's I also echo jazz. Uh, it starts with those who are interested. Um, you would notice that they would ask questions. Um, there would be suggestions. What if, if this could happen, something like that. Those kind of wishes and dreams, I think that's, that's a sign, that's a cue already that someone has that inside of them. I started out that way. I don't have any, any, uh, what do you call that? Anything done about diabetes. I did not have any work, credibility, whatever it is. I was not involved. But because I shared to one of the my endocrinologists, I said, what if there's a foundation? How could we set up this kind of foundation? Um, is that possible? I had a, a list of questions and I didn't know about this YLD. I didn't know about IDF. I was just wishing that there's something like that that could help out others. And that was, I, to my surprise, I got nominated um, without even applying because I didn't know about this. Then that started. I, when you, when you can see curious voices, I think that sparks an interest and that I think that would pave way to, to a more meaningful contribution to the society. So that's my, for my story. I guess lastly from me, I, I don't have much to add. Um, on top of the wonderful comments from Jazz and Joanna. So I'll, I'll say something practical. When I was trying to find more young people, I used social media um, and putting out requests via our organizations, Facebook or uh, Twitter accounts to find people that might be interested in doing something that would benefit young people uh, really helped. I, I got loads of interest that way. Um, and then also I, I put out feeders to you know, if there are doctors of people with type one that you know in your area, they could maybe pass on a message to some of their patients that are young uh, to get involved with the organization. Um, and that was another route that maybe would help to attract uh, young people. Great suggestions. I have a question um, for, for the three of you about uh, kind of a comment and a question. Because oftentimes I hear, well, I'm interested in applying for this program, but I don't have a huge idea. I don't know, and a little bit to your point, Johanna, I don't, I don't have, you know, I, I, I don't have this big, big thing I'm set out to accomplish it, but I'm really passionate and I think I can make a difference. Um, can you comment on if you've had colleagues or even yourselves or participants in the program where it's either been an existing project that the IDF member has, but not that it has to be this big, far-reaching thing. Certainly it can become, become that, but we all know we have a lot of work to do in, in the world of diabetes advocacy. So it might be interesting to hear a few examples, please. I think the one thing that I always tell um, on and on again is that change begins with one person. 
And this is something that I would like to hammer into every YLD's brain over here that um, the size of the project doesn't matter. The impact matters. I constantly tell this to my team as well that it's not about just delivering outcomes. It's about delivering impact. Now, whether that impact is changing one person's life, you've done something far greater than a lot of people have done. So whether it's helping one person better their diabetes management, giving one person the strength to speak up about their condition, giving one person to, uh, the effort to destigmatize, that those ones then slowly come together and form a bigger number. But you know, often like I'll tell you a personal example. During COVID, the first two to two, three months, we were really, really slow because, of course, everything was locked down. And we would just randomly have these phone calls about somebody with type 1 diabetes who's scared about their condition, who is scared about COVID. And we would just spend an hour talking to them, giving them some sort of comfort. That is also change enough. So I don't think we need to measure change by this huge, elaborate number. It starts with one, each one just to one. So deliver impact. Impact is not measured by the quantity, but it's always measured by the value and no amount of impact is ever less. So I think for anyone worried about I don't have resources or I don't have a huge project. That's fine. Start with one. That project is also doing a lot more than you think. Yeah, I, I agree with that wholeheartedly is is start small and, and think big. Um, and I, I think the IDF training for the Young Leaders program uh, gave you the skills, whatever the size of your project. And, and many of the young leaders, we had um, projects of all sizes, but they were, it's about them learning those skills and then thinking, how do they build on that? And I, I'm pretty sure as soon as they do one project, they, they then get really excited and wanted to do another project. Um, so it's, it is just about people start at different levels and they will they will grow at different speeds but what the young leader um program does is it it is flexible to support where idf member associations are and where the young leaders are in their in their kind of journey um and i think that's really important so yeah it the project can be as small as possible we had one project i did actually which was just to create uh, an infogram sheet for people when they went from um, the young clinic to the transitional clinic, just about the things that they should look after. And that's still being used today. And that was my smallest project out of the three big ones I was trying to do. Um, but it was possibly one of the most successful. So um, yeah, please don't feel overwhelmed by the need to do massive projects. That's not, that's not uh, what it's all about. Uh to be honest, project seems like a big word to me. So I said to myself, after a while, the I said to myself, what is it really that I can do realistically? I started to check um, within me, what am I passionate about? Then I look back, how did I change? Because when I was, when I started to have diabetes, I saw diabetes as a curse. But when I almost died, that's when I, learn that diabetes can be a blessing and it and how I really change it started when I become when I experienced the power of support group I simply reach out via internet then someone uh, responded then and allowed me to join a, a triathlon group and I said I don't want to do multi-sport I'm not for that uh, I, and that's not my dream, but they said, you can, you can like that. So I was really doubting and, you know, I have a lot of questions, how to handle hypo, la, la, la. But because that group, that support group allowed me to experience that kind of power, um, that kind of immense belongingness, um, that was so powerful that I realized I could use that, I uh, use my experience and pay it forward. So. After uh, YLD, I, I, I realized that even if I meet one person, uh, one person versus a lot, that one person is not a minority at all. So to me, projects, be it one person or more, it's not, it doesn't have to be quantified that way. 
as long as you are a blessing to others, that that means an impact has been a changed life has been made. So that I think that's counted. I'm getting the cue that we need to to wrap up. We've had a a wonderful discussion. I continue to be impressed by the work that you're doing. And maybe just if you have one quick, one last sentence. Here I am, I'm an IDF member association. Why, why should I nominate someone into this program if I'm not convinced already? Who'd like to take it first? I think it's very simple that the youth is not the future, the youth is the now. So nominate them now and let them deliver change. Uh, yep, I, I'd second that again. <laughs> um, and and it is a, it it is the future um, as well as the now, and it it will sustain your member organisation. It will build a network. It will really support you to grow uh, by investing in your youth. For me, MA should nominate because that single nomination can lead to a multi-should a tribe. Um, that voice, even tiny, short, and silent, is powerful enough to build others up. Thank you very much for all your contributions. Thank you for the work that you're doing in your communities on behalf of IDF. And uh, thank you for sharing your, your stories today. I think we'll go on to the next part of the program now. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. With that, I would like to introduce uh, the people who are doing all the work behind the scenes, uh, Beatrice Jimenez and Bruno Hellman, who are really responsible for the work that's being done from our office, from the, from the IDF office. So I'll allow you to introduce yourself briefly and go through the nomination process as the next part of this session. Please go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Kyle, and also thanks a lot for for agreeing to uh, to moderate the discussion today. It was great also to to have you, Johanna, Alex, and and Jas on today's uh, roundtable. I think it was very interesting, and we really hope that all the IDF members that were present today uh, and were listening to you are now more more committed than ever to to nominate people to the Young Leaders uh, Project. So my name is Beatriz Yanez Jimenez. I am the IDF uh, Advocacy Manager at the Executive Office. And one of the projects that I oversee is the YLD program together with my colleague Bruno. So my name is Bruno. I'm from Brazil. Before joining IDF as part of the advocacy team, I joined as a BCV. And then finally, I became a YLD trainee, which are still under, under the process. So for me, it's a, it's a huge pleasure to be here with Beatrice to, to share about this really important and impactful process. Uh, I have seen that we, after uh, we finish our uh, previous round table, we receive a couple of questions. So in case we don't address them until the, the end of our webinar today, we'll make sure to ask our panelists to answer those questions and we'll get back to you. So next slide, please. So again, why IDF member associations should nominate a YLD? Uh, because the YLDs, they are a supporter of their association and you are providing them the opportunity to receive leadership training from global and successful diabetes actors. We, we see from uh, the, the past and, and present experience as just uh, Alex, Jazz, and Johanna shared that uh, the, the, the training process was really important to them to become who they are. Uh, as Jazz importantly highlighted, you are not just investing the next generation of leaders of your own association, but you are investing of the present leaders. We have uh, a great example. My my friend 
Kaisa, who I think is joining her today directly from uh, Sweden, Kaisa Lindenberg. And she is a great example of after joining the program, she became the, the president of her uh, diabetes association. And she says that part of that is because she, she had the opportunity to, to join the YOD program and learn from the experience. And also you'll be uh, having a, a young ambassador to, to collaborate directly with IDF and other uh, members associations. So we have often uh, a lot of uh, speaking opportunities that mostly we, we make sure to, to guarantee that we have representations from the youth as because part of their training it involves uh, speaking opportunities and we believe that they are uh, not only an important face but mostly an important voice to, to echoing what IDF and the member associations do. Next slide, please. So, and now we move into the uh, wild denomination criteria. So yes, what uh, do the candidates uh, need to fulfill to be able to be accepted into the program? So we're looking for people that are living with diabetes. It could be type one diabetes. And of course, because of the age, we are looking for most of the people that have type one, but we have also had a few people in the past that had type two and even uh, less common types of diabetes. So we are accepting everyone as long as the person is uh, living with diabetes uh, themselves. Uh, we are looking for people who are between 18 and 30 years old by November 2022. Uh, this is because if it's possible, next year we will be organizing uh, a face-to-face -face training uh, in parallel to the IDF Congress that will take place in December 2022. We're going to be talking about that a bit later, but uh, we are looking for people who are between 18 and 30 in November next year. So that's uh, very important to bear in mind. Uh, the people who are uh, nominated must be able to communicate in English with the IDF executive office and also with the rest of uh, young leaders. Unfortunately, we cannot accept the uh, people that do not speak English. Uh, of course, the people need to be passionate uh, about working for diabetes and about collaborating with the, the diabetes community, and they must have an active relationship with the IDF members. So uh, they must know the IDF member, they must have a record of collaborating together, and this collaboration needs to be maintained during the whole YLD term, which in this case will be 2022 to 2024 included. Uh, we have been talking before, about the diabetes project. So all the YLDs must develop a diabetes project between 2023 and 2024. This is something that must be agreed with the IDF member. And again, we're going to be talking a bit more about that uh, later. Uh, and of course, uh, YLDs must have access to internet in order to be able to communicate with uh, the IDF executive office, also to be able to participate in some other online activities. And they must, um, be willing to allocate sufficient time to the program. Uh, it was a bit hard, but we have tried to estimate more or less the amount of time that people will need to dedicate. Uh, so the moment YLDs join the network, they will start receiving communications from IDF uh, and we will be requesting them to engage in some activities, for example, on WDD, on the campaign that we are having this year for the uh, insulin centenary. So these we estimate that will take between two and four hours per month. So reading all the emails that we send, responding to them and engaging in these activities. But then of course the YLDs need to develop this diabetes project. So they need to dedicate a bit of extra time to the project and that we haven't been able to estimate because it depends enormously on the type of project. So this is really up to uh, the young leader and the IDF member. Uh, Kyle was saying before that YLD is not about the face-to-face -face, uh, training opportunity. Of course, that's a big part, uh, but YLD is a three-year commitment. Uh, now, in 2021, we are looking for the people who are going to be YLD trainees in 2022, 2023, and 2024. So it's a three-year commitment, and we are looking for people who are willing to uh, commit with IDF, with the YLD program, and with the IDF member that nominates them for this three-year period. YLD is a super exciting, uh, exciting opportunity, uh, but we do not have 
uh, unlimited places. We uh, have two priority of members and we want to make sure that all the YLDs who participate in the program are committed to participate for the three years. Uh, and we are requesting IDF members to only nominate uh, their four people who have already proven, uh, who have a record of collaborating with them, who have proven their commitment and the fact that they want to, uh, to remain associated with us for three years. And we have a quote there from Bruno, which I think summarizes this slide uh, very well. Yeah, so I mean that the, the YOD program is uh, an amazing uh, development opportunity, but also brings a, a huge responsibility because you're not only representing your member association, but you're somehow representing your whole community, your all diabetes uh, fellows. So it, it's a continuous process that goes beyond the training summit. And even me, I wasn't able to attend the last uh, training summit in Busan, but even though I, before joining the, the executive office, I, I was involved with with the my member association and I kept involved uh, with the IDF executive office uh, for delivering the process. So it's it's something important to remind that is is something that goes uh, uh, beyond the training summit and it's a, a continuous process. So next slide, please. So the nomination process, uh, it's important to highlight that we only receive nominations coming from IDF member associations. If you are in doubt if your organization or if our organization in your country is part or is, is uh, listed as a member, a IDF member association, you can access our website. We'll share uh, the, the hyperlink on comments later. Uh, you go under network and you can see if that organization is part of uh, IDF network. Uh, and then you need to uh, contact them in case you don't have uh, a close relation. And of course, introduce yourself, introduce your, your motivation, and then the nominations need to come from them and through them. We don't accept nominations coming from uh, individuals directly. And the, it's important to, to highlight that the IDF members receive all the, the communication uh, needed regarding the whole process. So there are like two uh, main documents. One is the application form that has to be filled by the candidate and then a reference form to be filled by the IDF member. All the, both these document, uh, documents need to be submitted to our email address, which is advocacy at idf.org. And remember that that line for application is September 26. Unfortunately, due to the high volume of uh, applications that we receive every round, we won't be able to accept late applications. So next slide, please. So what is the timeline? So in October, IDF will communicate the, the results to nominee and uh, IDF members, and the su successful nominees will to integrate the program as trainees for 2022-2024, as Bea highlighted. Then in November, we'll have a welcome online session to introducing about the, the IDF as, as the organization and uh, uh, more deep uh, look on the IOD program itself. Then from November on, we'll start to share information and materials with all the trainees. And in March, we are expecting the trainees to submit a draft outline of the project. So when they submit uh, their application, they, they, they have to suggest uh, a project, but is just a primary, a primary uh, suggestion. You can uh, still change it until March, 2022. Uh, and this project, again, has to be implemented between 2023 and 2024. And then from uh, April to June, uh, the IDF team will assess the engagement of the YOD trainees from uh, the next cohort. Uh, and this is important for what's happening next, and Bea will talk about that. 
Yes, and before presenting this slide, just a reminder to all the attendees that if you have any question for Bruno or for myself about the nomination uh, process, you can already start writing that down on the on the chat. Uh, we're going to be having a, a Q&A in a moment with uh, with Kyle. Uh, so the face-to-face -face training, I was saying a few minutes ago that at this stage, we cannot guarantee uh, that we're going to have the face-to-face -face training in 2022. So hopefully this will happen on the side of the IDF Congress in Lisbon next year. But of course, it would depend a lot on what happens with COVID-19, if there are still uh, travel restrictions, and also we need to fundraise sufficient funds uh, for the Wiley project to be able to, uh, to organize this face-to-face -face opportunity. If the, the Lisbon Training Summit takes place, uh, we are going to extend invitations first to a few uh, wild mentors who have already participated in previous trainings, and then we are going to invite uh, mostly while the train is for the 2022-2024 period. But we will only extend invitations to people who have proved uh, they, they are engaged in the project. How are we going to analyze this engagement? Through the project outlines that Bruno was mentioning before. So we are going to be asking all YLDs in March to let us know which kind of project they want to develop in 2023-2024. Don't worry, we will prepare a template so everyone knows the type of information you need to send us. But it's very important that all the YLDs send this information uh, so we are able to assess who is actually getting very, very involved in the project and who is not uh, participating that much. Uh, once we have decided who wants to be involved, uh, we will start preparing uh, the attendance. Uh, this is going to be very similar to previous congresses, previous face-to-face -face training, um, trainings. So the travel to Lisbon will have to be financed by either the young leader or the IDF member. This is something that has to be discussed between uh, the two of them, and potentially it has to be discussed even before that uh, nomination takes place. But IDF always provides a number of grants to cover the travel of a few wild trainees coming from low and lower middle income countries from all the IDF regions. So we select one country uh, per region, and we have a few more spots for Africa because it's, it's of course, the region uh, with the highest number of, uh, of lower income from countries. Uh, IDF, on the other hand, will cover all the accommodation, uh, the meals and the transportation on site in Lisbon for all the people who attend. Uh, we cannot really, uh, we cannot be sure of how many people we will be able to attend if the training takes place, but to give everyone an idea, the last two trainings uh, we had around 60 uh, attendees, more or less. And of course, we will support as much as possible all the young leaders with the preparations. We will have another webinar to, to give you all the information you need. And also, we will prepare invitation letters uh, for those um, YLDs that come from countries that will need a visa to, to enter Portugal. So that's something that we, we will do as well. And I think this is yeah, the last slide of the nomination process. So uh, yeah, I think Kyle already had a couple of, of questions for us, and then we'll see if, they, if the attendees have any extra questions. Thank you very much to both of you for going through that so efficiently. Uh, I have a couple of questions. I'll start with this one. Can IDF members nominate more than two candidates knowing that only two can be accepted? That's a, a very good question. We we also had this question a couple of years ago when we were uh, recruiting the previous cohort. Uh, we are asking IDF members to do as much as possible to only send two uh, applications. We understand that a number of IDF members, because they collaborate a lot with youth, especially the, the IDF members who are working mostly exclusively with children, they may have more than two candidates. So we're asking everyone to please do as much as possible to only send uh, two applications. However, if you have three, if you have four, and the IDF member really cannot decide who to, uh, well, cannot select if, if you think, okay, I cannot make this decision, you can still send all the applications to IDF and we will make the decision, of course, knowing that there will be a maximum of two uh, young leaders accepted per IDF member. We still don't have a criteria for this. We will have to see if we choose the older candidates because the younger candidates will have the opportunity to apply again in two years. Uh, that's something that we will need to discuss, but uh, well, we're asking everyone to do as much as possible to only send two. If you cannot, we will make the decision for you. 
Thank you for that. I have another question here. What does IDF expect uh, from each party? So the YLD versus the IDF member association, for example. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so that's something it's uh, it's very linked to what we have been discussing already about the projects. Also, uh, some of the things that have been mentioned in the round table about collaboration and, and really doing things on the ground. So YLD, the whole point of the project uh, is not only to collaborate with young people, which is very important, but the idea is that the people that we train take those learnings to actually uh, make a change in their countries, to actually change the lives of people living with diabetes in their community. That's the whole point. So what we are expecting from both uh, the YLDs and the IDF members is collaboration, uh, a very fluid coordination between the two of them. We are asking them to, to talk, uh, to, to go through the different expectations that the young leaders have, to agree also on the type of activity that the young leader is going to do for the, uh, for the community. Uh, there are, let's say, two approaches. We could have uh, YLDs who run projects that are their ideas. So that's, uh, yeah, I don't know, I'm thinking, for example, if a young leader wants to do something on social media, a campaign that could be something that the young leader starts and the IDF member supports. Uh, but then there is another uh, modality. It could be the young leader leading some activities that the IDF member develops. And here a very, very clear um, activity could be uh, the young leader uh, leading some of the sessions, some of the yeah, uh, activities in a diabetes camp that the IDF member runs. So we are not asking the young leader to do a big project, to do a diabetes camp for zero. It would be perfectly okay if the young leader says, okay, my focus, I think it's very important for young people in my community to uh, receive better education on this topic. So the young leader can have sessions uh, on the diabetes camp specifically on that. What we are asking the IDF member is to allow the young leader to, to have a leader uh, role in some of these activities. Uh, so actually uh, they learn from these uh, leadership skills. Uh, we are not asking for very big projects. I think it was Johanna who said it, every little thing that you do counts, even if you're only reaching out to one person that is good already. So yes, just think about that. Uh, we have a lot of young leaders that come with very complex projects that need a lot of funds. That is not going to be possible in most cases. So maybe start thinking small and then you can escalate. Uh, Alex was saying that a lot of people continue doing projects even after they finalize the YLD uh, engagement. So think of this as the beginning of your, of your role as a, as a leader in the diabetes community. And one more question here that I see, can Wildies work independently from the IDF member associations? Uh, yeah. yeah, so obviously not. We are really hoping for a collaboration here. And that's why we are insisting IDF members so much that they nominate people, they know uh, they are engaged with the diabetes community. And ideally these people may uh, have had already a collaboration with the, with the IDF member directly. Uh, the young leaders uh, must collaborate and support the mission of the IDF member and the IDF member also must support the young leaders in the development of the project. Uh, every uh, few months we are going to be asking the young leaders to report on the progress on their projects. So we prepare templates again so everyone knows once what to report upon and these uh, reports for example needs to be signed by IDF members. So we really want them to have an ongoing communication. We don't want them to only talk once a year. Uh, we think that is not going to work, that is not going to be helpful for the, the diabetes community. So we are hoping for that, for a really fluid communication and a collaboration around the, a project they both choose. If I may add to that, Beatrice, I think uh, for me, one of the most interesting observations looking past the last 10 years has been actually uh, projects that have, have come up from uh, someone who perhaps wasn't immediately so engaged with the member association, but as the project developed and emerged, it, it was kind of operating in parallel with campaigns, uh, and there was a really strong partnership that was cemented, even if it didn't happen, maybe immediately, uh, many years later. And I think uh, this, if I may, that this is really because this program, uh, we're standing on, on the shoulders of, of giants, people like Paul Madden, and, and Debbie uh, Jones and, and many of the faculty members from 10 years ago, the impressions that they've left, 
the training that they've impressed upon some of the people you've heard today is passed on from from generation to generation. So I'll, I'll, I'll get off my soapbox now, but wanted to take the opportunity. No, and I think what you're saying, it's, uh, it's definitely the case. Uh, and I think the key again is communication. Uh, communication before the nomination even takes place. So I think it would be great, not everyone may do this, but I think it's great if the IDF members already have a chat uh, with the YLD candidate before the application actually takes place uh, to discuss, okay, what do you have in mind for the project? Is there something in particular you want to do? Or the young leader says, look, I'm very interested in this. What do you think about this for my YLD project? I think it's key, uh, communication. Uh, and as long as there is communication, there won't be any problem between both parties. If communication is not that fluid, if it's not that transparent, some issues may come up. So we really recommend uh, all the IDF members and the YLD uh, candidates to talk. I don't see any other questions immediately. I'm trying to look at the chat window. If any of my other colleagues see one that I'm missing, I know we're already over on time as well. So perhaps if we didn't get to your question today, we'll try to follow up with you. We should have your coordinates from the registration in, in the session. Thank you, Guy. Yes, uh, everyone can send uh, questions to our emails, uh, to both Bruno and I. So yes, we will be happy to, to take any questions afterwards. Thank you. Well, I think I've already, uh, thank you both, Bruno and Beatrice. I think I've, I've already uh, made some cl concluding remarks in, in my previous question uh, slash comment. And so I don't have um, much further to, to add. I, I think uh, there's an enormous amount of work that goes into to this program. You can imagine the logistics. Uh, so a huge, huge thank you to the office for, for coordinating all this and allowing me uh, to be the face of it is in your moderator today when there's so many people that are that are actually doing the work. I would encourage you to to look into this program. Uh, I've seen huge benefits as we've described and heard from uh, some of the young leader alumni and existing young leaders. And if you have any questions, it's an ongoing and evolving process. I'd like to leave you with that. Uh, many of us are living with diabetes that are working on this. We've each uh, lived our own experiences in our own countries that is very individual, just like diabetes it, itself. And we learn from one another. So by hearing you and listening to you, your questions and comments, we hope this will continue to be an evolving process and that the program can help meet your needs in creating, um, not uh, to quote uh, one of the panelists today, not, not the future leaders, uh, but the leaders of today. Uh, because the, the future is now and we need to involve young people in, in work as, as soon as possible. With that, I thank you for your attendance, for your time, and look forward to continuing the conversation. Bye-bye for now.